Well, good morning. Happy Easter to you guys. Good to see you. How you doing today? Doing well? Yeah, it's a good day. It's an amazing day, isn't it? So I want to welcome everyone to community, especially those of you that are joining us for the very first time. And I want to welcome those of you that are joining us online as well. We're live streaming, so we're so glad that you're here. Now, we've been doing this each service, and some of you, this is going to be familiar for you. Others, it's going to be the first time you've ever done this. I mean, this goes back almost 2,000 years. I researched this. I, it's not in the Bible, but it happened pretty soon after the Bible was written, that believers would greet one another, especially in, in recognizing and celebrating the resurrection, when one person would say, he is risen, the person would respond and say, he is risen indeed. And then leaders, pastors would say that to the congregation, he is risen, and the congregation would respond back, he is risen indeed. Are you guys up for that today? Okay. All right, here we go. Here we go. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He has. And that's what we're celebrating today. We are, and that Jesus, he conquered death, and he conquered sin, and he brings hope and life. It's a possibility for every single one of us. Now, I know something about every single person in this room. I don't know everybody, but I know something about every person in this room, that every single one of us are, are hopers. I mean, we have hopes. Every single one of us, by just our nature, we have hopes, and we live by hope. People go to school, and they hope for the day that they'll graduate. People graduate and they, they hope then they'll find a job. And people who are single, they, they may hope to get married. And people who are married, they may hope to get kids in the house. And then once they get kids in the house, they may hope to get kids out of the house. I mean, we have hopes. I mean, I've just I'm been there, empty nester now. It's, it's, it's a good season of life, trust me, it is. And so there are a lot of things I don't know about the person that's sitting next to you, but I do know that person has hopes. I mean, hope I get that job, hope I get that house, hope I get that girl, hope I get that girl and she gets that job and we get that house. I mean, however it plays out, I mean, we, we have hopes. One of my favorite stories, and I haven't told this one in about a decade, but I love this story about this guy that was out jogging late one night. And he jogged you know, usually about three nights a week, and he had his usual course. Every now and then, not pretty rarely, he would take a shortcut through a cemetery. And he, because he would jog along the street with streetlights, he wasn't aware how dark it was. I mean, there's no moon out, and the clouds were, were kind of closing off any light that was there at all. And so he's jogging down the street and decides to take a shortcut through the cemetery. And it's, it's dark, darker than he's ever seen it before. And he's unaware that there is a freshly dug grave in the cemetery for a burial that's going to happen in the morning. And, and so he's jogging through. He doesn't even see it. He falls into this hole. And it's a deep hole. He tries to jump out and tries to climb out, to claw out. And he yells out and he's trying to, there's nobody around. And after he does this for a while, he goes, you know what? I'm going to be in here till the morning. So he just decides he's just giving up and he just goes into a little dark corner of, uh, of this grave of this hole and he just tries to catch a little sleep. Well, about an hour later, there's another guy that's jogging who decides to take this shortcut through the cemetery. He too can't see very well. Goes right in that same hole. And this other guy, he's, he's jumping up. He can't reach the top. He's trying to climb out. He's yelling. He can't do anything. And, and then he just catches his breath. And then he, he feels a hand reach back on his, <laughs> on his shoulder. And a voice says, you can't get out of here. But he did. <laughs> he did. Sometimes all we need is a little motivation. That's all we need. <laughs> He had all the motivation he needed to get out of that. <laughs> Here's the thing. Sometimes we go through circumstances in life and we go, you know, I don't think I can get out of this one. The hole's too deep. I don't think I can get out of this one. Have you ever had the hope knocked out of you? Probably you have. We all have. And there are a lot of things in life that are overrated. I mean, a friend tells you about a movie, you go, wow, it's overrated. It didn't live up. Didn't live up to the expectation. Certain restaurants overrated and maybe a concert that you're looking forward to seeing, you know, going to is overrated. And I mean, I love sports. I mean, I, I love almost all sports. And, uh, but sometimes there are certain games that you look forward to that they just don't live up to the hype and they're overrated. There are a lot of things in life that are overrated. Let me tell you one thing that's not overrated. Hope is not overrated. 
We all desperately need hope. That's why I love the Bible, because the Bible speaks directly to our need for hope. And this is so interesting that in the Bible, the word hope appears 81 times in the New Testament. Just one time before the resurrection of Jesus, 80 times after the resurrection of Jesus. You see the correlation? You see, our hope is based upon the fact that Jesus conquered death, that he rose from the grave, and that because of that, he can bring life and hope to every single one of us. And that's the hope that we look forward to. When the Bible talks about hope, it's not just talking about some mere optimism, some positive mental attitude or rose-colored glasses kind of hope. That's not what the Bible's talking about. The Bible's talking about a hope that is a, you've been knocked down, you get up off of the mat kind of hope, that you're having this hard day, this rough day, and this hope sustains you through the tough times of life. It's a resurrection kind of hope. And that's what we're looking at today. I love Matthew's account of the resurrection of Jesus. It's found in Matthew 28, verse 1 and following. Matthew wrote these words early on Sunday morning as the new day was dawning. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they went out to see the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. And his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook, and they became like dead men. Now, these guards, these were trained Roman soldiers. They were the elite forces, special forces of the ancient world, and they were terrified. And then verse 5, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. Now, anytime someone says that to you, you know there's a reason to be afraid, right? (laughs) Do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen. Just as he said, just as he said, he is risen. Okay, I'm going to give you another shot at that. (laughs) Okay, I I, I believe in you. I believe that you can do better. Let's try it again. He is risen. Okay, hold on to that thought because I might just say this again in the message later on. So, okay. Now, we celebrate the fact that he has risen because Jesus conquered death and he brings us hope. Now, we're just going to jump right into the message today. And like Henry VIII said to his six wives, I won't keep you long. Okay, so we're just going to jump right on into this. So, so. Too soon? I know. It's only 500 years ago. So let's just jump right on in. Now, what does Easter mean? That's the question. I'm going to give three answers to it. First of all, what does Easter mean? It means that Jesus is who he claimed to be. Easter means that Jesus is who he claimed to be. Who did Jesus claim to be? He claimed to be the Messiah, the Christ. That's who he claimed to be. We talked about that in this teaching series the last few weeks. Matthew chapter 16, he said, when Peter said to him, you are the Christ, the Messiah, he said, yes, I am. I am the Messiah. He claimed to be the son of God. Jesus said about himself in John 3, 16. He claimed to be the savior of the world. He claimed to be the death slayer. Jesus made some very bold claims about who he was, who he is. And it may be that that you don't believe that. As a matter of fact, I was reading this past week that one out of four Americans who believe in the teachings of Jesus don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And so maybe that's you today. And if that's you, I'm so glad that you're here because I want to talk to that just for a few minutes today. Dave Stone is a pastor friend of mine. I've known Dave for, I don't know, 30 years and a and, uh, good long run. And uh, Dave and Beth, my wife Lori and I know them. And Dave's pastored a church in Louisville, Kentucky. And years ago, when his kids are about the same age as ours kids, when his kids were really young, uh, he wasn't the pastor at that time, his associate pastor, Dave and Beth, and their, and their two daughters, uh, Savannah and Sadie, they were on their way to an event, and they stopped at a funeral home along the way, because Dave wanted to stop in. There was a it was a man whose father died. And so he, he kind of prepped his girl, said, look, I want you to stay out here with mom, and I'm going to go in. There's a man whose dad died, and I want to speak with him just for a few minutes, and I'm going to come back out. Are you girls okay? Yeah. So anyway, he walked in. As soon as he got into the funeral home, he realized it was the wrong funeral home. <laughs> it's in the wrong place. So he just turned right back around, walked back out. It wasn't 10 minutes. It was about 60 seconds. And he got in the car. He said, girls, guess what? And Sadie, this five-year-old with big eyes, said, he's alive? He's alive? <laughs> you know. It doesn't take much to convince a five-year-old. Maybe it's probably going to take a little bit more to convince you the fact that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is who he claimed to be. The most important issue that you will ever settle in your life is this one. Is Jesus Christ God or is he a fraud? 
I mean, that's a legitimate question. I mean, we have to ask that. Is Jesus Christ God or is he a fraud? Your answer to that question will determine the rest of your life on this earth, and it will also determine your eternity. That part is, is for sure. You see, Jesus made bold claims, outrageous claims about, about who he was. And Jesus said and about being God in, in John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will live even though they die. John chapter 10, verse 36, Jesus said, I am the Son of God. Bold claims. Bold claims. Now, no doubt you've heard people say this before. Maybe you've said this, that, that I, I believe that Jesus was a, a, a good man, a, a great moral teacher. Maybe, maybe he was even a prophet, but that's where I draw the line. I don't, I don't believe that it was actually God. I, I don't believe that he rose from the dead. I, I believe that he was a, a great moral teacher. And uh, that sounds really very reasonable on the surface, but that's not actually a possibility. It, it's not. C.S. Lewis was a devout atheist. I mean, he, he, he was not a believer in any kind of way. Brilliant thinker, but not a follower of Jesus. And when he investigated the evidence for Jesus Christ, it led him down a path to becoming a, a follower of Jesus. And, but he said of himself, he said, I came kicking and screaming into the kingdom of God. It's not where he wanted to end up, but it's where the evidence led him. And he became this great writer, this brilliant thinker of the last century. And he wrote so many great works. And one of them is the book Mere Christianity, which has helped just millions of skeptics you know, over the decades, actually go from skepticism or doubt or agnosticism to faith and belief and becoming a follower of Jesus. And, and C.S. Lewis, he takes on this thought about, I, I believe that Jesus was, you know, a great moral teacher, a good man, but not the Son of God. This is what C.S. Lewis said in his book, Mere Christianity. He said, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, that I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit on him. You can kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let's not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He's not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So here's the thing. Jesus was not just a good man. He was either much, much more than that or much less. C.S. Lewis defined it this way. He said that Jesus was either Lord or a liar, or a lunatic. He said that Jesus is either the Lord who he claimed to be, or he was a liar and a deceiver, or just this raving lunatic, delusional. Not just a good man. He was either much more than a good man or much, much less. And he says, those are the choices. So how do I know if he's God and not a fraud? Romans chapter 1 verse 4 says, Jesus Christ our Lord was shown to be the Son of God when God powerfully raised him from the dead. Friends, there are over 2 billion people on the planet that are testifying to the fact that Jesus Christ conquered death and rose from the dead this weekend. 2 billion believers in Jesus on planet earth. There's an empty tomb in Israel that testifies to the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. There are millions of people every year and so many people that are part of this church that would testify to the fact that they've had this, this inner transformation of their life. It was just this powerful change between who they were and now who they are and who are, they are becoming as they surrender their life to Jesus Christ. Jesus appeared to over 500 people after he rose from the dead. And these people were alive and they talked to other people and the testimony that they had is huge authenticating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then we have, you know, the ancient documents, biblical eyewitness accounts from people who were there, they rubbed shoulders with Jesus Christ. And we have those that just testify to that fact. And we also have a fulfilled prophecy that predicts Jesus, that he would, he would come and he would live and he would die and he, and these prophecies that were written hundreds of years before him are amazing. 1947, there was a little Bedouin boy down by the Dead Sea. And he's, he's being a guy. He's out there with his sheep or his goats. And he's, he's watching over them. And he's a little kid. And he's just, you know, this guy's throwing rocks. Throwing them up against the round. Thump. Thump. And he throws one. 
And that one, it goes through this little hole and it cracks this, this piece of pottery. And inside the pottery, there were these scrolls. And it, it led to the greatest archaeological discovery of our time that points to the, the fact that Jesus is who he claimed to be. Because in that uh, discovery in the Cumon community, the Dead Sea Scrolls, is the Isaiah Scroll. Now, what's the Isaiah Scroll? The book of Isaiah was written 700 years before Jesus walked on planet Earth. But we'd had no copies that, that went back this far. And, and the Isaiah Scroll uh, predicted exactly the, the birth of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the character of Jesus, and also predicted how he would be crucified. And, and it's eerie when you read this, knowing that it was written 700 years because it was God that was at work prophesying, making all these predictions that was happening. But liberals, would, would, scholars would always say, you know what, what they did was, is that after Jesus lived and after he died, they went back and they inserted all of these prophecies to make it appear like that this was predicted before. They say that it was 700 years, but they just added all this later. The Dead Sea Scrolls discovery blew that away because Back in 1995, uh, the University of Arizona did carbon dating on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the Dead Sea Scrolls are carbon dated to be 125 years before Jesus even walked on the planet. So these predictions are real and true, and they substantiate the fact that Jesus is who he claimed to be. There's a guy by the name of Chuck Colson. That name's going to be familiar to, to some of us, but not to all, because, I mean, he was kind of prominent, and this was decades ago, back in the 70s. Chuck Colson was uh, an assistant special advisor for President Rich, Richard Nixon. He was known as his hatchet man. He was a rough guy, not a believer in any kind of way. And he was like in the center of the Watergate scandal that brought President Nixon down. And Chuck Colson was actually the very first one to go to prison as a result of that because of his involvement in the Watergate scandal and also uh, the cover-up of that. And Colson wasn't a Christian when all that happened, but because of this crisis and losing everything and going to prison, before he went to, Christ, before he went to prison, he became a believer in Jesus Christ. And it was, it was the real deal. I mean, it was transformational. And, and he wrote book after book and, and just really encouraging the church and defending the faith. And this is what he said about the resurrection of Jesus. I needed to give you the background on that. Colson said, I know the resurrection is a fact. And Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men, the apostles, 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it were not true. And then he said this, Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. <laughs> He said, you're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Friends, people will die for a lie that they believe to be true, but they will not die for a lie that they know is a lie. And every one of the followers of Jesus, the, the disciples, the apostles, I mean, they were beaten and they were stoned and they were imprisoned and they were executed. And they never recanted. They never said because they believed deeply. Why? Because they saw, they saw the resurrected Christ. And that's a powerful testimony to the fact that Jesus is alive. It's two years ago we had a guy speak at our church by the name of Lee Strobel. And Lee Strobel, another devout atheist, Yale-educated, brilliant guy, life's going on, award-winning investigative reporter for the Chicago Trib, and then something happened that wrecked his world. His wife started going to church. <laughs> There's an emptiness in her life, and she started going to church, and she was searching, and then, then she did the unthinkable, <laughs> because she was an agnostic too. She she became a follower of Jesus. She became a Christian. And, and the changes were dramatic in her life. But, but Lee Strobel, I mean, he lost his wife and he lost his life in a sense because she's now not the same person. So he went on this quest, this two-year journey to disprove Christianity. This brilliant thinker because he wanted his wife back. He wanted his life back. And at the end of two years, Lee Strobel, he came to faith. In Jesus Christ. And 
he spoke here two years ago. He told us his story. And he's one of the great defenders and writers about Christianity today. And he wrote a book. His first one, I believe, was The Case for Christ. And this book we have available in our bookstore. You can just get it online. And uh, if, if you have questions, I just want to let you know that. That would be a great, a great place to go on this. If you have questions, we are so glad that you're here. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus to the core of my being. I've studied, I'm, I'm, I'm a skeptic. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I am. I mean, I had all kinds of questions, all kinds of doubts, and it was through my investigation that brought me down this path. That's why I've even taken time on this, because that might be you. I know it's not everybody, but it might be you as well. And I want to let you know, if that is you, if you have questions, if you have doubts, you're here because somebody drugged you today, or somebody promised you lunch after, or, you know... <clears throat> Or you're here because she invited you and you're going to go regardless, you know. And, and so anyway, whatever it is that brought you, I'm glad that you're here. But your answer to the question of whether Jesus is God or fraud is the biggest question ever. It's not only going to affect this life, it's going to affect the life to come. It's going to affect your eternity. So if you're here, I just want to let you know you're very welcome here. Um, this is a safe place to ask questions about God. And I, I hope that you'll continue on. In Jeremiah 29, 13, God says, you will seek me and you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. So here's my, here's my uh, encouragement. If you have some questions, try to find out if there's answers. Don't think that just because you don't have an answer that there's not an answer. I mean, talk to me. We'll, we'll give you some resources. We'll direct you down the path. We'll walk with you through this. We, we really want to help someone that's searching. But you have to ask yourself, are you an honest doubter and you really want to find the truth? Or are you just kind of a dishonest doubter and just not even really care? I got my questions, but I don't care if there's an answer or not. And so I want to encourage you to be an honest doubter. You'll seek me and you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Now, the resurrection validated his incredible claim to be God. Jesus is who he claimed to be. What does Easter mean? Well, it also means that Jesus has the power that he claimed to have. He has the power that he claimed to have. We talk a lot about power today. We have power lunches and power talk. I was on PowerPoint for this presentation, you know, this week. And I ate a power bar this morning so I could make it through all the services today. After the one o'clock service, between the one o'clock and the six o'clock service, I will take a power nap, uh, you know. So, um, <laughs> so we talk a lot about power. As a matter of fact, yeah, I, I kind of live on Amazon. I mean, I'm Amazon Prime. So I went to Amazon and I just put in the word power. All departments, you know, I just want to see. It came up over a million times. There are over a million products that we can buy on Amazon that have the word power connected to them. I was surprised at that. I was not surprised when I went to Google and I did a Google search for power. Over four million results for power on Google. I mean, how to dress for power, how to eat for power, how to shower for power. <laughs> The one hour power shower. <laughs> okay, I made that one up. That's not there. So, Now, there's never been a more powerful person than Jesus Christ. Why? Because he was God. And because he was God, he can do everything that God can do. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, he says, All power in heaven and on earth is given to me. In John 10, 18, Jesus said this. He said, No one takes my life from me. It wasn't an accident. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up again. I mean, the world has never seen power like in Jesus Christ. Jesus had such a magnetic personality that the crowd swelled. They followed him. They just flocked to be him, to hear him speak and maybe to be healed by him. And Jesus would, would heal people with a touch and sometimes just with his voice. And the blind would be able to see. The lame could walk. Lepers were cleansed. I mean, Jesus was this transformational game-changing person, powerful person, God in the flesh, and people were drawn to him. Jesus defied the authorities of that day. They had never seen, people had never seen raw power like they saw in Jesus Christ. Why? Because he could do everything that God can do because he is God. And when Jesus stretched out his arms and he hung on a cross, many people thought that day they were seeing weakness. <laughs> They weren't seeing weakness. They were seeing power, the power of God at work, the power to cleanse us of our sins, the power of someone dying in our place on a cross. And then on the third day, on the third day, I mean, that's when there was real power. There was power. No force could keep Jesus in that tomb. The Romans killed him. They put him in the tomb. They 
put a big stone in front of that tomb, and then they sealed it with the Roman seal. I researched this. It was Gorilla Glue uh, 1.0 is, uh, is, is what that was. I mean, it was the strongest stuff they had back then. They did the Roman seal. And then they posted this, this 24-hour guard, and they were trying to prevent the inevitable. <laughs> It'd be like you and me going out to Fort Lauderdale Beach and trying to keep the sun from rising. It's not going to happen. Jesus only went in that tomb so that he could prove that he could come out. And he has the power. He has the power that he claimed to have. So here's my question to you. Could anybody in this room use a little bit of Jesus' power in your life? Anybody? Yeah. So maybe today is the day that you say, you know what, I, I want some of the power of God released in my life. And every single, this is my 25th Easter message at Community. And I, I'm pretty sure that every message for the last 25 years, different verses I'll use, but I always use this one. It's my favorite Easter verse outside of Matthew 28. It's Ephesians, Paul, I mean, Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. This is the Apostle Paul. This is what he's talking about, the power of Jesus that's available to us. He said, I pray. This was Paul's prayer. And friends, i got to tell you, this is also my prayer. It is my prayer for you. I pray that you'll begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help those who, who believe him. It is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. You see that? The very same power that raised Jesus from the dead is power that's available to you. It's power that is available to me to change my circumstances, to transform my life. It's available to make changes in our life. See, the resurrection of Jesus gives you the power to close the gap between the life that you are living and the life that you want to live, the life that you've always wanted to live. That's what the resurrection will do. And this is what this is saying. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying. That there are, if, if God can raise the dead, then there's nothing that he can't do. If, there's no problems that are too big for God. Your problems are no longer greater than your God. No matter what you're facing, what you're up against, God is bigger. God is stronger. God is greater. God is for you in your life. Isn't that some great news? Isn't that something to celebrate? That God is for us and that he has the power to transform our lives? Some of you are saying, okay, Scott, you don't know about my life. And I might not. You're saying, Scott, you have no idea what a deep financial hole I'm in right now. And God does. You have no idea how dead my marriage is. God does. You have no idea how estranged I am from my daughter, from my son. God does. Scott, you have no idea how far I have distanced myself from God. God knows. He, he knows all of that. God specializes in hopeless cases. God loves to be involved in hopeless cases in where he can reverse desperate situations. Why? Because he's the one that gets the credit. I mean, when we go, you know what? Only God. This was God. This was only God. This wasn't me. This was God at, at work. And, and there's no problem that is too big for our God. That's the power of the resurrection. I want you to hear this. If God has the power to raise a dead person, he can raise a dead marriage. He can raise a dead career. He can raise a dead dream. God has the power to do anything. And if he doesn't change our circumstance, our situation, he has the power to give us that we can go through that circumstance, through that situation. Now, friends, you're not dead yet, so you're not done yet, okay? And God has the power to work in your life. Jesus has the power that he claimed to have. What does Easter mean? It also means that Jesus does what he promises to do. The cross was no surprise to Jesus. The Bible says that he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He knew what was going to happen. It was all a part of God's plan from the very beginning. The apostle John in the book of Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 says, the lamb of God, that's Jesus, the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. This was not a surprise. Jesus' death was not an accident. He knew exactly what was going to happen. It was a part of God's blueprint from before the beginning of time, from the moment that the fruit touched the lips of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the shadow of the cross appeared on the horizon. Jesus said this in Mark chapter 10, verse 34. He says, they will mock me, they will spit on me and flog me with their whips and kill me. But after three days, I will come back to life again. What a prediction, predicting his death and his resurrection. Isn't that amazing? 
He knew what was going to happen. Matthew 28, verses 5 and 6. Then the angel spoke to the women, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He's been raised from the dead. And I like that last statement, just as he said would happen. Friends, if there is a man who can predict his own death and predict his own resurrection and then pull it off, I'm going with that guy. I just, I'm just, I just am. I don't know about you, but I'm going with that guy. I'm going with that man. Jesus is who he claimed to be. He has the power that he said he has, and he keeps the promises that he makes. And one of the greatest promises of all is the promise of the forgiveness of sins. Because every one of us have those. I mean, we all have those times where you know, God's best, God's plan is this direction, and we go a different direction. That's just the truth about me, and it's also the truth about you. But here's the good news. It's that Jesus died in our place on a cross to take the penalty for our sin so that our sins could be forgiven and washed away. Jesus, he said this about himself, probably the most familiar verse in all of the Bible, John 3, 16. These are Jesus' words. Now he's talking about himself, but this is what Jesus said. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, talking about himself, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life, everlasting life. How? Because our sins are forgiven. Our sins are washed away and cleansed and, and, and forgiveness can become a reality. But how does that happen? It's if we believe in him. It says, it says there that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And so there's got to be belief. But truth is, later on in the Bible, it clarifies belief isn't enough. It's not just belief. I mean, it's acceptance. We just don't like just believe that Jesus was the son of God. It's not to know that Jesus is the risen Lord. He has to become our Lord, our risen Lord. So we not only believe, we accept, we surrender, and we follow. And when we make that decision to follow Jesus then the hope of heaven can become ours and we can receive the forgiveness of our sins. I, 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 I like to do what I do up here, but believe it or not, I, I really like before services. There's kind of some stress, to be honest with you, doing what I'm doing up here right now. But there's not a whole lot of stress me talking to people between services. That's why I hang out. I mean, I love even when I'm not speaking, I just hang out. And I talk to people all day long and I get to hear a lot of you. And, and sometimes somebody will tell me about something that they've done something horrendous to the point where they cannot forgive themselves. And, and, and I know what's up. I mean, I've heard this so many times when somebody can't forgive themselves, they can't even begin to imagine that God could possibly forgive them. Well, the Apostle Paul, who wrote more than half of the New Testament and talks about God's amazing grace and his forgiveness, was a terrorist. He really was. I mean, he would, he would follow after the Christians, but when he was not a Christian, he would follow after the Christians, and he would, he would be a part of murdering them. So here, here's this murderer who received the amazing grace of Jesus, and now who is this follower of Christ. And so even if you've done that or anything less than that, I want to let you know that the amazing grace is available for you. You've not done anything that be, is beyond the reach of God's grace. Let me even say it this way. You're never so bad that you're beyond the reach of God's grace. But let me also say this, you're never so good that you're beyond the need for God's grace. You might say, you know, I haven't done a whole lot. You know, I'm kind of, you know, keep my nose clean. Yeah, yeah, I've lied. I've you know, done this. But, you know, I'm not done what my neighbor's done. I've not done what my brother did. You know, and we can compare ourselves. And comparatively speaking, we can say, you know what? Based upon the curve, then, you know, I'm better than others. And you know what? God's not grading on the curve. If we've sinned, we need forgiveness of our sin. And so if... You're never so bad that you're beyond the reach of God's grace, but you're never so good that you're beyond the need of God's grace. I want us to read this next verse out loud together. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Let's read this out loud good and strong, okay? Here we go. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. It's a great verse. It's one of my favorite verses that because of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, the old can be gone, can be dead and buried, and the new life can become a reality. But what we're going to do today is we're going to personalize this verse where you see that word anyone is kind of highlighted, bolded. Well, that's going to go away, and right now it's coming up as a blank. 
And that's where you're going to insert your name. We're going to read this out loud together. And I would read this, and I would say this means that Scott Einan, who belongs to Christ, has become a new person. Now, you don't say Scott Einan. You say your name, okay? So we're going to just want to clarify, like to be very clear. So here we go. Let's read this out loud. Insert your name at the blank, and then we'll read the rest of the verse. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This means that who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. Friends, that's what can happen. I wanna let you know, Jesus, yes. And here's the thing, Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. That's why he came. He came so that, so that we can put the past behind us. Jesus offers a better now. But he offers more than a better now. He also offers a better place. He, he, he offers forgiveness of our sins so that we can have this better place, this better hope. I love what First Peter, the apostle Peter wrote in First Peter 1, verse 3 and 4. He says, what a God we have because Jesus was raised from the dead. We've been given a brand new life and we have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And the future starts now. So that's our hope, that, that that can be real. I know churches don't talk about heaven too much, but you know what? We're going to spend more time on the other side of, of death than we are on this side. And 500 years from now, you're going to be around. The you that is you, the soul that you are, you'll be around. Whether you want to be or not, and you will, ever, you will either spend eternity in heaven, the hope of heaven, or you'll spend eternity in hell. Based upon the decisions and the choices that you make in this life, how you answer the question, is Jesus Christ God or a fraud or do I even care? And he's inviting you today, he's calling you to make that life-altering decision to accept him as your Savior and as your Lord so that you, you can have sins forgiven, you can have his power in your life and you go on this great adventure with him and you can have the hope of heaven one day. That's what he's, he's calling you for. He is. Friends, the stone. The stone was not rolled away on that first Easter morning to let Jesus out. It was not. Stones do not hold gods and tombs. The stone was not rolled away to let Jesus out. I believe from from the text there, that he was already gone. The stone was rolled away so that we could look in. And we can see that the tomb is empty, that he's alive. And because he's alive, we can come alive. And we can have forgiveness of sin and his presence in our life in the here and now and the hope for a better now and a better day. But it's when we accept him as our Savior and Lord because he is the Lord of all. One last time. Here we go, good and strong. He is risen. And that changes everything. It changes everything. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today grateful that Jesus has risen, that he conquered death. Father, we, we thank you that, that he went to a blood-stained cross where he experienced a horrific, excruciatingly painful death as a substitute for us. God, we are forever grateful for that. And God, we're forever grateful that he not only died for us, but he, he rose for us and he lives for us. Father, there are many of us in this room that there's no place we could ever imagine being other than in a church on this day to celebrate the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And for that, we're thankful. Father, I'm sure there's some people in this room that it's not typical for them to be in a church. And, and God, I'm so thankful that they're here. I, I'm, I'm thankful, God, that, that you, through your spirit, you just will communicate to them that, that you love them, that you care about them deeply, that Jesus died for them. God, I, I, I pray that some decisions are being right now made right now in this moment, some to follow Jesus, some to maybe to, to see if there are answers to questions and, 
answers to doubts that someone might have. God, wherever we're at in our spiritual journey, I just want to thank you for this day, the greatest day in history, the day of all days that we celebrate the hope of Christ Jesus. We thank you for his death. We thank you for his resurrection. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.